about Larkin and the contemporary poets who actually came to the literary scene following the great modernists. As we know, modern period in English literature, uh, particularly the field of modern poetry in English literature, uh, it is actually a very important time uh, because a number of famous poets, hmm, uh, they actually began the modernist movement in literature during the war years, particularly the in-between years between uh, the First World War and the Second World War, as we know. And we are acquainted with the name uh, names of those poets who actually dominated the literary scene during the uh, so-called uh, modern period or who actually spearheaded the modernist movement in English poetry, like T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, or later Stephen Spender, W.H. Auden, uh, Louis Magnus, hmm, Cecil Day Lewis, who are actually known as the poets of the 30s. Okay, so there is a kind of, there is a kind of clear development uh, from the point of view of themes as well as from the point of view of most important figures writing in his poetry uh, in the following decades, particularly uh, in the 1960s, in the 1970s, and uh, he died in 1985, as we know. And Philip Larkin is clearly the most popular and the most prominent voice in the sphere of post-World War II British poetry. Okay. Uh, he was the most remarkable figure in the 1950s movement poetry. As uh, we are used uh, to the practice of naming different movements. Hmm. For example, uh, for example, the uh, first half of the 20th century, uh, was dominated by the poets who are known as the modernists. In the 1930s, there came a group of poets who were leftist in their political belief and at the same time who were actually uh, trying to continue the modernist trend uh, popularized by Eliot and Ezra Pound. And they are known as the poets of the 30s, like Auden or Spender or Magnus or Cecil De Lewis. After that, in the 1940s, there came another group of poets who are known as the apocalyptic poets or they are, the name of the group was the apocalypse. We are perhaps acquainted with these particular names. Yeah. Apocalypse group was actually spearheaded by Dylan Thomas. And following the apocalypse, apocalypse group was that particular group uh, which was actually spearheaded by Dylan Thomas and their poet, poems were uh, very complex and very uh, chaotic juxtaposition of different themes drawn from the social, economic, political and religious, uh, uh, religious spheres, hmm, references. They actually tried to write uh, a kind of poetry that was thematically and technically very complex. And their poems were full of uh, riddles. They were not very uh, easily uh, relatable to the readers. They were actually erudite and they were actually very, uh, very difficult poets, uh, to put it in a more uh, simple way. Okay. And following the apocalypse 
group or following the uh, apocalyptic group of poets uh, whose chief exponent was uh, uh, Dylan Thomas. There came a loosely associated, thematically loosely associated group of poets. And uh, that particular group of poets are known as the movement poets. Now we have to know the meaning of the term movement, why it is called movement and what the movement poets uh, did try to achieve through their poetry and how influential they were in the uh, literary sphere of England in the 1950s and 1960s. What is the legacy of those particular poets? So all these are some very pertinent questions before we start discussing the poem, the Whitson writings, because these are all background studies or these are all uh, some contextual details hmm, which you have to keep in mind for a better understanding of the Whitson writings. And that is why today I am going to give you a kind of short introduction to the po uh, poetry written in England in the post World War II period or after the Second World War was, was over, hmm, what kind of poetry was being written that is the matter of uh, examination today. Okay. Now, uh, Is the movement is the is a loose grouping of poets who actually made their names during this particular time. Okay, the term was first used by you may note it down. The term was first used by J. D. Scott. The very term, the movement, it was first coined by. J. D. Scott uh, in a in an article, and the name of the article was in the movement, okay, which was published in the Spectator magazine on October 1, 1954. So, uh, the term movement came to being in the year 1954. And it was first coined by J. D. Scott, okay, who was a minor poet as well as a critic. And he wrote an article, and the title of the article was In the Movement. Okay. Now, although the movement also includes novelists, the movement poetry, we know that our movement poetry, but movement this particular literary literary uh, association uh, this association consisted not only poets but it also consisted of some novelists for example we can take the name of the novelist Kingsley Amis a very famous novelist who was also a very close friend of Larkin who is actually uh, famous for the campus novel, Lucky Jim. Okay. Uh, the movement, therefore, was a particular association of writers, not only poets. Although the poets are now more famous than the novelists because of their association with the so-called movement, a term coined by J.D. Scott. Okay. The, although the movement included novelists and playwrights, there were some playwrights also who were included in the group called the movement 
For example, Kingsley Amis, I have already told you, Larkin's lifelong friend was in this group. It is now identified with only those poets included in Robert Conquest's. Very important, you have to keep in mind. It is now, the term is now applied to those poets whose poems were included in an anthology of 1950s poetry which was edited by Robert Conquest. The Robert Conquest is also a fellow poet of Larkin and he is also one of the most important poets belonging to the so-called movement group. Okay. Now, Robert Conquest, he actually edited a particular anthology of 1950s verse and the name of the anthology was New Lines. New Lines. And this book was published in 1956. Now, today, we understand the name movement in relation to the poets who were included in the in the So who are the poets whose poems are included in the anthology, in the uh, particular anthology uh, entitled New Lines? The poets were Conquest himself. I have already pointed out that Robert Conquest was also a poet belonging to the movement. Conquest himself. There was Donald Davy. There was Kingsley Amis. Although Amis is today known mainly as a novelist, Kingsley Amis, today his reputation rests upon his novels. Okay, like uh, Lucky Jim, The Old Devils, uh, which won the prestigious Booker Prize. Uh, in, this, in this connection, uh, we can also take the name of Martin Amis who is actually uh, Amy, Kingsley Amis' son. Okay, he is also a very famous novelist. Now, this man, Kingsley Amis, he actually wrote some poems in the early part of his career. In the early part of his career, he wrote some poems. And his poems were included in this book. The book is New Lines, edited by Conquest. Robert Conquest was there, Kingsley Amis. Uh, as a poet, he published there. There was DJ, DJ Enright. There was Tom Gunn. Uh, there was Elizabeth Jennings. There was Philip Larkin and John Owen. So this particular term movement poetry or movement poets, they can be now applied to these particular poets who actually published their poems in 1956 in the book called New, Line, New Lines edited by Robert Conquest. So who are the poets who are today known as the movement poets? Robert Conquest, Kingsley Amis, Donald Davy, okay, uh, DJ Enright, Tom Gunn, Elizabeth Jennings, Philip Larkin, and John Owen.
Now to introduce movement poetry, we have to go through the very important introduction written by Robert Conquest in Neo Lines. Okay. Conquest's introduction to Neo Lines claimed that they shared a negative determination to avoid bad principles. So why these poets are uh, united uh, in a particular belief about poetry? Because I quote, they shared a common negative determination to avoid bad principles. Okay, I, I am coming to the point, what is bad principle and why they are actually protesting against the bad principle. Okay, or what did they consider as a kind of bad principle that actually infected poetry in the writings or in the poems of the poets who written before them or in the writings of the poets who or the apocalypse group of poets, they were uh, driven by a kind of bad principle in relation to their style of writing poetry or in relation to their uh, poetic theme according to conquest. And they are protesting against those bad, bad principles by writing a new kind of poetry by moving from the bad principle, they are trying to create a kind of good principle. At least what they think to be a kind of good principle. Okay. Now, this particular idea, a kind of negative determination to avoid bad principles, it is very important in this context. But what made the movement poets to be rationally uh, intelligent individuals who were only interested in the insignificant detailing of daily life in an anti-romantic and rather prosaic manner? So what is the characteristic feature of movement poetry. The characteristic feature of movement poetry is simplicity, okay, thematic simplicity as well as poetic simplicity. We know very well that modernist poetry that was being practiced by Eliot or Pound or later W. H. Auden or uh, in the 1940s by Dylan Thomas. Modernist poetry is marked by a kind of complexity. Okay. Uh, modernist poetry became very complex because its tendency was to be very learned, very pedantic, very uh, erudite. And a reader who is going through a modernist poem or a poem written by either Pound or Eliot or someone like them, they are about to encounter a lot of complexities. So what are the complexities which are there in the poems written by Eliot and uh, or Pound? We are 
about to encounter different allusions. Taken not only from English texts, but also from different texts written in different countries and in different languages. For example, if you go through Westland, there are different references taken from the French literature, taken from the Germanic tradition, even taken from the Sanskrit literature. For example, uh, there are stories from Brihodaranya Upanishad, our very own Brihodaranya Upanishad, uh, uh, which have been actually uh, employed hmm, uh, in this particular poem, Westland. And Westland, the famous poem written by Eliot, it actually ends with Shanti, 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 peace. Yeah. Uh, a particular concept which we find in the religious Hindu scriptures, particularly in the Vedas. Okay. Now, a reader who is English or who is European, for him it is not very easy to understand Hindu mythology or uh, classical allusions. But if you have to understand modern poetry, you have to be a very large very intellectual, uh, very erudite, and very complex as a result. And modernist poetry actually posed a challenge to the reader, because she is actually going through a particular poem, which is full of a lot of things, which is pregnant with different traditions, different cultures, different languages, hmm. or a kind of macaronic verse was being practiced by those poets writing in the modern period. Okay. Now, what the movement poets tried to write is the very vice versa of what the modernists did and what particularly Dylan Thomas did, because their main uh, adversary was their immediate predecessor, Dylan Thomas, who also wrote symbolic, mythological, chaotic verse, full of uh, mystic connotations. His poems were not very easy to understand, as we know. It is actually a large network of different allusions, religious ideas, okay, or mystical thoughts, hmm, uh, religious revelations, etc. etc. The, what the movement poetry tried to achieve? Movement poetry tried to achieve a kind of simplicity both in terms of themes and in terms of technique. They try to concentrate upon the everyday life of England in the 1950s, the England which is already devastated by two great wars. A England which is now a gloomy place owing to the death of many young men in the Second World War and in the First World War that preceded it. The society in general, the changing face of the society in the age of upcoming globalization, they tried to describe the current milieu in a daily, everyday language, in a matter-of-fact matter uh, tone, and 
in the uh, style of newspaper reporting therefore when you are going through a particular poem that is written by the poets belonging to the so called movement group of poets you are about to uh, about to go through a poem that is very simple that is written in simple language and that deals with people who are commoners and that deal uh, that deals with themes which are uh, very familiar uh, which are actually full of details from the everyday life of people living in provincial provincial england in the 1950s so now perhaps you can understand the meaning of the term movement movement uh, means moving from somewhere so what kind of movement was it it was a movement it was a movement from the cerebral intellectual elusive intertextual complex difficult poetry practiced by the modernists the poet uh, poets of the 30s and the apocalypse group to a particular kind of poetry which is simple which is uh this is called movement we know the term movement but often it is not very clear why these poets are, poets are called movement poets because they were moving from the cerebral intellectual kind of vas practiced by the modernists and the poets uh, who followed them to a kind of vas that was that was very simple that was very familiar that was very lucid both in terms of their themes and in terms of their technique okay now you can ask a particular question the why were they trying to move from the modernist uh kind of writing okay or modernist kind of poetry uh, poetry uh, the kind of poetry eliot wrote the kind of poetry pound wrote the kind of poetry oden wrote so why they were moving from them why it was a kind of movement the answer to this particular question perhaps lies in the anxiety of influence okay and the term or the phrase anxiety of influence perhaps uh, you are acquainted with the term the term was first used by harold bloom in the book called the anxiety of influence and the book was published in 1973 it is a very famous book the herald bloom in the book anxiety of influence developed a theory propounded by walter jackson bet okay and he is develop he developed a theory propounded by walter jackson bet another famous critic and walter jackson bet actually introduced this particular theory in his book the burden of the past name of the book the burden of the past and the english poets the burden of the past and the english poets and the book was published in 
170. Okay. And in that particular book, Walter Jackson Bitt tried to prove that all poets, all English poets following Milton inevitably suffered from the anxiety that there is little left for them to accomplish or they were suffering from the anxiety that they may be, they might be overshadowed by the fame and talent of their immediate predecessors who are more popular, who are more influential. Okay, I am coming to that particular point. Now, they were suffering from the anxiety that there is little left for them to accomplish. Perhaps this anxiety motivated Larkin and his compatriots to avert the mystical romanticism of the 1940s known as apocalyptic poetry spearheaded by Dylan Thomas. Okay. Now what is the anxiety? It happened in our very own poetic sphere. of modern Bengali poetry. And the poets who came after Rabindranath, they tried to do things which are fundamentally opposite to the kind of verse Rabindranath wrote. Because they were suffering from the anxiety that if they imitate the great man Rabindranath, they may be overshadowed by the sheer genius of Tagore. Because imitating Tagore, they cannot be a very great writer. And that is why they tried to write something which is totally different from, which is totally different from that of Tagore. Okay. This is the anxiety that there is a very famous poet who was writing before me and if I follow the footstep of that particular great poet, I may not be a very famous poet because people will consider me to be a mere follower of a great poet and that is why poets we are trying to write something which will actually leave a kind of mark for themselves. Reader will not consider them to be the blind imitators of their immediate predecessors. And movement poetry tried to move from the cerebral poetry, intellectual poetry, elusive verse, intertextual verse written by the modernists and Thomas, the immediate predecessor, because they tried to leave their own mark in the field of poetry. According to them, intellectuality, cerebrality and other things uh, or elusiveness or complexity, these are some bad principles. I have already told you, Conquest is uh, trying to prove that uh, the movement poets, they were against the bad principles in poetry. So what are the bad principles? Bad principles are actually the experimental, cerebral, intellectual strain of modernist poetry, which was actually popularized by Eliot and Pound. And they were against those things. They tried to 
return to the inherent simplicity of poetry. They were trying to write something which is very familiar, which is very easy, and which is actually easily relatable to the readers. And that is the movement. Movement from a particular kind of poetry to another kind of poetry. Here, movement from the complex, difficult, cerebral, intellectual, modernist poetry to a kind of simple and uh, everyday uh, idiom okay, in the arena of poetry. So that is the movement. That is why this particular group is known as the movement group. Okay. So what kind of movement is there? It is a movement from a particular kind of writing, particular ideology uh, dominating writing to another kind of ideology dominating writing. And what led to this particular change? Perhaps the answer is in the anxiety of influence. They were thinking of the fact that modernist poetry dominated England for more than four decades now and we have to do something new to make our mark. Okay. Now, in the poems of Larkin, there is little erudition and there is a kind of plain anti-romantic account of little uh, and insignificant Uh, relatable writer. We can easily relate with his sensibility, with his ideas, because he actually keeps it very simple for us. He is not actually making poetry erudite, pedantic, or experimental, or something like that. Okay. His poetry stands in contrast with the complex, chaotic, elusive and macaronic verse of the great modernists like Eliot and Ezra Pound. The hatred for these immediate predecessors was not profound, was so profound that Larkin even excluded T.S. Eliot from his edited book, the Oxford book of 20th century English verse. 1892 to 1932 that was published in 1973. So this hatred for the modernists, it was so pungent that Larkin omitted T.S. Eliot's poetry when he was given the opportunity to edit the Oxford book of 20th century English verse. He actually kept the poems of a number of famous writers, famous poets in that particular anthology. But significantly, he did not include any poem by T.S. Eliot. Now, let's see. The Dinsho-Sodabdi Rekta Ingreji Kobita Anthology Berochche. Jekhane T.S. Eliot er Kobita Ne. Eta amra bhattehi pari na. But Larkin actually excluded T.S. Eliot. So why? Because Larkin did not consider T.S. Eliot to be a good poet. The hatred was so incisive, the hatred was so severe that he did this intentionally and it became hugely controversial. Okay. That Larkin began, Larkin began as a novelist. We have to keep in mind that Larkin began as a novelist. Later he shifted to poetry writing. It is today a very little known fact that Larkin began as a novelist. Before dedicating himself solely to poetry, he published two unsuccessful novels. 
the first novel was jil in uh, that was published in 1946 and the second novel is a girl in winter and it was published in 1947 larkin had not published much in his lifetime we have to keep it keep it in mind larkin had not published a lot of poems during his lifetime okay Uh, he became the most loved among the post world war 2 british poets just for 83 poems that came within two covers in the books like the north sea published in 1945 his first anthology or first collection of poems the north sea it was published in 1945 then came the less deceived in 1955 then came the famous book the wits and weddings the title poem is in our syllabus we are going to go through it okay the wits and weddings it was published in 1964 and his last book high windows that came after a gap of 10 years 1974 and larkin died in 1985 and interesting to note that larkin did not write anything in the last 10 years of his life because he a very uh, very uh, familiar poet or a very popular poet during his lifetime particularly in the post world war 2 period and those 83 poems uh, also uh, caused many controversies we are no uh, we are not going to deal with that because larkin was also a very controversial figure hmm. we are not going to that particular extent uh, because that is not very pertinent in this context okay now larkin's poems according to critics they are marked by a particular uh, particular idea and the idea is the idea of englishness the idea of englishness the term englishness has become almost synonymous to larkin's poetry and his poems are mainly sad lyrics of succinct length where he uh, repeatedly appears as a kind of detached observer of post world war 2 and post imperial britain its changes and compromises sometimes participating into it and sometimes not participating into it okay this so called englishness is marked by its solidarity and orthodoxy and the poet assumes different persona to express the modern changes and compromises as larkin was the larkin was of the opinion that i think of larkin's letters it's very sensible not to let people know what you are like so larkin was a very conservative kind of man he did not marry in his life he was a librarian in the university of hall and he actually was not at all a very public figure because he was xenophobic from the very uh, childhood and he actually avoided large gatherings he was a remote kind of person and he uh, lived not in the din and bustle of the great city like london he actually lived in the university town of hall which is actually a margin not the center 
ओके तो लार्किन वॉज ए काइंड ऑफ डिटास्ट ऑब्जर्वर ऑफ एवरीडे लाइफ इन द पोस्ट वर्ल्ड वॉर टू पीरियड इन द पोइट्री ऑफ लार्किन लाइक इज ओन आइडल टॉमस हार्डी नाउ हियर कम्स द पर्टिकुलर पर्टिकुलर पॉइंट द लार्किन वॉज राइटिंग पोएम्स द लार्किन वॉज राइटिंग पोएम्स रिटिन बाय लार्किन वॉज राइटिंग पोएम्स रिटिन बाय लार्किन वॉज बीइंग इन्फ्लुएंस्ड बाय द बाय द पोएट बाय बाय सम पोएट्स एंड द फर्स्ट पोएट वॉज टॉमस हार्डी and the second poet poet was john bedjeman okay the two are very famous famous poets writing in the modern time but who were not modernists in the real sense of the term as we know thomas hardy wrote all his poems in the 20th century because after jude the obscure he stopped writing novels he wrote only poems he wrote only poems and all his poems came out in the past two decades of the 20th century now larkin considered thomas hardy as his idol he also had a deep respect for john bedjeman another poet who was writing in the modern period but who was not contemporary society dealing with human life dealing with love dealing with uh, crisis of living etc etc the so like hardy like bedjeman larkin was also a poet whose poems are sad in nature okay whose poems are sad in nature the so larkin was also a pessimist like that of his idol thomas hardy okay we find the pessimistic outlook towards life in general in the poems of larkin the themes in his poetry mainly pertain to contemporary england individual and society human relationships illusion and reality and time in the whitson weddings and here two journey poems or in dockery and sun he gives us the changing face of english countryside or in charge going the famous poem we are provided a heart rending picture of the post war decadent religiosity okay in towards revisited some of his famous poems or talking in bed we come across contemporary urban england okay again larkin's person are gravely concerned with their place in society the ordinary defeated outsided outsiders are some constant entities in his poems and they are depicted with care depicted with uh, real uh, realistic touch by him in many poems many famous poems like mr blini livings deception ambulances next please etc at the same time larkin's poetry is so death ridden that he is called often the most sad heart in the post war supermarket he is often mocked at by his detractors that larkin is the most sad heart in the post war supermarket because his poems are so sad in nature so uh, pessimistic in nature that he is often rebuked by many critics 
as the most sad heart in the post world post world war to supermarket okay and he is often related to the graveyard poets of the of the of the of the 18th century as we know uh, in the 18th century there came some poets who dealt with the sad reality of mortality in human human life and their poems were often uh, situated in the uh, literal literal graveyards and those poets are known as the graveyard poets for example we have uh, perhaps we have gone through uh, lg written in a in a country churchyard by gray or we are acquainted with the name of the poet thomas parnell who was actually uh, a famous name in the sphere of graveyard poetry of the 18th century the larkin is often called a modern day graveyard poet because of his obsession with death and mortality frustration and depression uh, uh, his concentrate uh, concentration in the uh, negative sides of human existence in the uh, age of change age of globalization okay and the themes of death and inform old age they are quite common of old age in a symbolic way okay now all these points are very important when you are going to read the wheats and weddings by lakin because if we we are about to uh, go through a text it is very important to know the context in which the poem was written what kind of uh, text is it uh, who wrote it what kind of verse he was writing during his time and what is the legacy of that particular writer okay the all these things are very important when you are about to start a particular text hmm, for a kind of critical reading because in our class uh, this is a uh, post graduation class and we are about to have a kind of critical reading of the text we are not actually uh, some lay readers when we are going through a text we have to judge it, judge it critically and from that point of view all these things which i have pointed out in today's class were very important for a better understanding of the text which we are going to start in our next class that is the wheats and weddings the wheats and weddings is a poem written by uh, larkin and it is a journey poem we uh, will come to that particular poem in our next class but it is a journey poem and it is actually a characteristically movement poem because of its uh, simplicity because of its uh, description of the provincial uh, provincial england in the post imperial and post world war 2 period and it is also a characteristically larkin poem because of the sad uh, lurid tone and the philosophies of life in which the poet believed himself okay and all these things you have to keep in mind uh, for a kind of critical reading of the text the wheats and weddings uh, which is also a very famous poem written by larkin and it actually uh, features in the uh, in the in the 
collection of poems written uh, written by Larkin, uh, which was published in 1964, and the collection of the poem in which this particular poem uh, is included is also known as the Whitson Weddings. And the Whitson Weddings, from that point of view, was the title poem of that particular collection. Okay. Okay, that's all for today. If you have some questions, you may ask now. Sir, why he didn't uh, write anything in his last ten years? That one. Okay, will you repeat, please? Okay, sir. Sir, why he didn't uh, write anything in his last ten years? That is a very uh, difficult question. Why he had not published anything? Actually, he was writing uh, poems, but he uh, was very irregular in publishing them. Uh, according to his biographer Andrew Motion, uh, he has a very uh, very good bio biography written by Andrew Motion. Andrew Motion is incidentally uh, a very famous contemporary British poet of today. The Andrew Motion uh, wrote uh, the biography Death of his mother. Larkin became very lonely. He was uh, a lifelong bachelor, as I have already told you. But it is not clearly known why he was not publishing poems hmm, in the last 10 years of his life. But perhaps he was depressed hmm, and he has, uh, was a person of pessimistic demeanor, as I have already pointed out. And all those things uh, perhaps actually played a great role in that long silence. Okay. Okay, sir. Anything more? Okay. Is there any other question? So in our next class, please uh, uh, come with the uh, come with the text that is uh, the Whitson Weddings, and we will actually go through the poem together. Okay, thank you.